The second presenter is Professor Dr. Zoraini Abbas. Professor Dr. Zoraini Wati Abbas is the Deputy Vice Chancellor at Waswasan Open University in Penang, Malaysia. Prior to this, she was the founding director of the Center for Learning, Teaching and Curriculum Development at Sampurna University in Jakarta, Indonesia, where she was also the acting vice rector for academic and student affairs. Zoraini is Malaysia's e-learning pioneer and advocate for online learning. She was consultant to the Malaysian Ministry of Education, National Center for e-learning and distance education in Saudi Arabia and Telecom Malaysia. She is Malaysia's first MOOC contributor to an international audience in 2011. She was a columnist in the Star, New Straight Times and Utusian Malaysia with about 800 articles published. She was top two educators among 14 influential higher education leaders in Southeast Asia and has been conferred an Education Leadership Award from the World Corporate Universities Congress in 2014. She was recently appointed an Honorary Commonwealth of Learning Fellow. Now I will invite Professor Zoraini Abbas from Wawasan Open University to deliver her speech. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, everyone um, for for being here this uh, this um, uh, afternoon, uh, thank you to uh, Professor um, uh, Varma, yeah? Professor Varma, for the invitation to speak today. Basically, my title is ODL disrupted, and that's what it was uh, when when the um, uh, semi lockdown started in Malaysia. Well, what I'd like to touch on is maybe how we adapted to the new normal in higher education and some ideas on how um, I personally think uh, most ODL institutions should move forward. Um, I'd like to just share, very, very quickly share uh, what uh, the Wawasan Open University looks like and uh, basically our brief profile. Uh, basically, we're an open and distance learning institution that caters to both full-time on-campus students and part-time ODL students. The majority are part-time ODL with 93%. Uh, the first intake of um, uh, Wawasan Open University students uh, was in 2007, about 700 plus, and we have five regional centers uh, in, in uh, five different cities in Malaysia. We, we have currently about 5,000 enrolled. And basically, we're a university by the sea. Penang is an island, just like Mauritius, yeah? Uh, we are a university by the sea, and uh, as you know, not many universities are next to the sea. We all know the world has changed, and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has definitely changed education, and we believe it's forever. Uh, uh, but the main thing is, um, some people think uh, the coronavirus is a friend. Some people think it's a foe. Uh, for people like me, maybe people like us today, um, it is a friend because probably a silver lining for advocates of the 21st century learning. Just like Pravarma was saying earlier, uh, this uh, probably presents an opportunity for changes. Yeah, the mindset change and the way we, the the, the modes that uh, we use to deliver, um, yeah, the way we think about you know um, assessment and so on. Uh, but there are others, uh, even in ODL institutions, they feel that uh, it was not a choice, yeah? Uh, what you call this? Uh, the coronavirus presented uh, a threat because there was no choice but to go into remote learning. Uh, typically, uh, in um, what was an open university, we have a blended learning model. So we have face-to-face -face, uh, plus the... Um, online learning in between the face to face. Uh, when COVID-19 struck, we had to move very, very quickly from face to face sessions to remote online sessions. And I think uh, probably every one of us can relate to this. Uh, tutors who had no previous experience uh, doing online sessions had this uh, challenge of, uh, uh, that's related to technical or pedagogical uh, they really didn't know what to do yeah, online. 
some of them were talking were uh, acted like uh, were, were giving talking head lectures when actually we can be quite creative uh, when we do things online and the students had no previous experience online except some of them uh, were in uh, industries where Zoom meetings were quite common, you know, Zoom or Webex and so on. So they were fine. But the majority of the students uh, had no previous experience of, of, of uh, going through online tutorials. Um, unfortunately, we also had a few students who had no access uh, to the uh, uh, computers or had poor connectivity to the internet. And uh, there were some limitations yeah, for them. And um, uh, some of them also didn't have Wi-Fi at home. Some of them didn't have access to computers. So in response to that, the university now is uh, or has arranged uh, for, for uh, discounted um, uh, pricing uh, to students who are interested to buy notebooks. So that's been announced uh, to the students uh, recently. And uh, come July semester, uh, about a month, they will start the new semester. Maybe we'll see some students purchasing notebooks. Or we are also um, uh, selling some of the older PCs, so that is also on offer to students, just in case uh, they had a very low budget to buy computers. In overcoming the challenges, there were some hand-holding sessions uh, of the tutors by, by our course coordinators. Uh, we have some about uh, 45 full-time ac academics and about 450 tutors to help us manage some 1,000 courses. Uh, in any one particular semester. And there were some practice sessions, you know, before they actually went online. Uh, there were some practice sessions uh, between the tutors and the course coordinator to make sure that they could handle the um, online sessions well. And typically we would, we used uh, Zoom, MS Teams and Skype, and sometimes WebEx. We also provided some tip sheets uh, to the tutors. Uh, for the final exams, because there was a directive not to have students come to campus, uh, there were online tests for the students um, and also assignments uh, in place of the final exams. And the directive for the next semester is to have online, online classes until the end of December. So we're proceeding uh, with this final exam alternatives. Some of the lessons learned, now we had our, our exams uh, committee meeting about two weeks ago. Uh, we found that, very interestingly, uh, students uh, scored better grades uh, for their courses, yeah? because in the end they had not just the two assignments and exams, but they had three assignments. And there were increased passing rates for many of the courses, maybe um, I mean, almost all, if not all. However, there were some non-submissions of assignments uh, because they had, for example, work more from home and then didn't have time uh, to work on their assignments. Or they had, uh, because everyone was staying at home, so if they had a, a family, you know, with young children, they too had to help with the children. And if they were, if they were ladies, if they were wives, if they were mothers, uh, they had a lot to do at home. So then they couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, pay much attention to their own study. So there were non-submissions of assignments. Uh, some of them also said because they had a challenge uh, getting uh, access to a computer or to the internet, yeah, mainly because I think the whole family depended on, on the internet and the computer. So there were some challenges as well for a few students. Moving forward, um, personally, these are some of my ideas and suggestions. Um, if we consider the... Um, rest of the industry, I'm just picking one industry, the Airbnb, uh, the um, uh, hospitality industry. Uh, we have the CEO, Brian Chesky, uh, who said after the pandemic, there's going to be a big change in the reason uh, people travel. Uh, they will be traveling for fun, he says, not for work. Uh, previously, people have traveled for work and entertainment and entertain themselves on the screen. And he thinks that pattern is going to reverse. And uh, he believes that there will be a rise in people choosing to live uh, as um, uh, digital nomads because they won't be tied to one city for their jobs. And I think we can see this happening uh, with the evidence of uh, a lot of co-working space. And, um, and um, I wonder 
the education will change quite drastically. It could be that students could be in any city in the world and studying in a university is not in the same country. It is, for ODL, it's a student studying um, from anywhere in the country and then they travel a little bit, you know, one or two hours even to the nearest learning center. But this one could be, you know, even in another country. They could be an ODL student, but of a university in another country. So we might see some of that happening. Okay, um, I'm not sure how many of you would remember the picture on the left, which is a tablet um, with a little pencil. I used this when, when, when I was in primary school, and uh, it was when the teacher asked us questions and we would write on the board and then sh uh, showed it to him. Or he would write something and we would copy what he wrote, or something like that. Uh, and then sometime, and that was in 1890, sometime... Um, about a year and a year more, uh, sorry, a century uh, and a few years later, we saw the, the iPad, the Apple iPad. And, um, you know, the change between the, the tablet, the simple tablet and the iPad is so, so is, is tremendous, yeah? Uh, too many changes uh, in terms of uh, what we can do with the iPad. We can shop, we can do banking, we can study um, uh, with it, we can, we can email, we, I mean, communicate and everything else. Um, and then come COVID, okay, let me just, yeah, that was in 2010. And then just 10 years uh, later, after the iPad um, was introduced to the public, we have COVID-19. Now, these are just some of the changes. If we look at it, um, it's been quite an interesting change, but of course, no one expected COVID-19 to make such a drastic change to us. And possibly we have a new normal now even for, for, for ODL, and I would think that, you know, if I were to categorize this, it would be about uh, having enablers. It would be about new policies. It would be about infrastructure, changes uh, that we need to do to improve infrastructure. And it's about learning design as well. So, and, and to me, it is about creating a new culture of learning, just like uh, Prof. Varma was saying. Um, it's an opportunity uh, for us to do new things. Uh, and for us to, of course, also have this new mindset. And uh, we need to reconsider how we design the learning. Uh, Pravama, I was attracted to your, to your concepts of uh, authentic learning and all that. And uh, it does motivate you yeah, for 21st century. Then, of course, the assessment, new ways of assessing, not only one or two or three methods, but maybe even a dozen different methods that we could try out with. And then, of course, the equity. Uh, to make sure that everybody has access uh, to education, uh, to make sure that everybody um, has a notebook, uh, everybody can afford uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, what you call this, uh, the amount of uh, bandwidth. Um, then it's about connectivity, really, with all the uh, equipment. Um, and then affordability. Uh, how can we... How can we um, uh, make it affordable for the students, especially the devices. Can we work with the telecommunication companies or the internet service providers in particular uh, to, to give discounts, yeah, discounted rates uh, uh, for those involved, for stakeholders in education? And when we have things like this, we have to consider about learning on the go, uh, about the mobility of learning for our learners, and uh, to make sure that everyone is self-reliant, tutors included, full-time staff, students as well, to be self-reliant, I mean, to be, to be able to manage uh, whatever the new normal requires. Of course, we have to prepare them for that. Same thing with, you know, being able to self-manage themselves, the time, their time, their stress level, and so on. Okay, um, I'm not sure how much time I, I have left. I didn't time oh, myself. Already, yes, I think you have to wrap up in one minute because we are already... All right, all right. Okay, if you talk about the pedagogy technology integration, number one, we have to think that pedagogy comes first, and with the pedagogy, then we choose appropriate technology. Of course, we, we, are, we know about this face-to-face -face pedagogy, but right now uh, at WOU, for example, we practice blended pedagogy. Now we have to jump into online pedagogy, and this is where, I'm just going to talk about online pedagogy. We have asynchronous uh, technologies as well as synchronous uh, technologies, I mean, uh, technologies that allow that for the synchronous sessions, and there are many things that we can do for each one. Uh, but the more important thing is to me, in ODL especially, is student engagement. 
And student engagement is about having the highly skilled teacher, choosing the suitable pedagogical approach, and employing the appropriate technology to achieve student engagement. And student engagement is, is about students uh, being um, uh, cognitively challenged at the right level, uh, being, um, uh, what you call that, um, connected to their tutors, to their uh, full-time course coordinators, to the whole university. And basically, I, I think it's about humanizing education. Uh, student engagement to me is key to student success because in ODL, uh, we want as many students to succeed. They came into the university with a dream and we want them to achieve that dream of uh, being on the stage uh, uh, to receive the scrolls. So basically, student engagement, eventually um, finishing course after course after course and completing semester after semester after semester and eventually graduating. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, yes. Professor Zoraini, for giving that presentation on how you adapt to new normal in higher education. You talk yeah. about online classes and assessment, the challenges of working from home and remote learning, as well as how the new normal in, in uh, ODL, the new culture of learning and humanizing education. Mm -hmm.